guys and welcome back to my channel. My name is Madeline and this is Made With Books and today I have a guest and that's Daniel, my boyfriend. Hi guys. Who's here to answer your serious and also not so serious <laughs> questions about him. We're starting off with the most serious one by Alan Morton who just desperately needs to know how do you put up with your naughty girlfriend? She must drive you crazy. Thanks Alan. <laughs> It is very hard, it is very hard. I think the question is rather how do I put up with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a more serious note, Alan also had a sincere question, at least I hope the other one wasn't. <laughs> Who is your favorite author and why? Yeah, I would say my favorite author is the US American author Paul Auster. And yeah, I've been thinking about the question why actually. Um, I think probably because he combines these elements of mystery and detective novel, which I really liked when I was younger and still like. Um, he combines those with um, the more philosophical literary questions that I'm interested in nowadays. I think that's a combination that I really enjoy. And along the line of favorites, Pauline from Dancing Alone wants to know your top three French and German classics, but I think you've cheated a bit and have you didn't only include classics, yeah, did I'm you? Yeah, I'm not sure you would consider uh, consider all of them classics. Um, most of them, probably. So I will begin with uh, Jules Barbet d'Orvilly. He's a, a writer of the 19th century who wrote quite creepy, gothic, horror novels, short stories as well. He's quite famous for his Diabolique, which is a cycle of... Uh, Gothic tales, one could maybe call them, and this is Une Histoire Sans Nom, uh, which I read while I did my semester abroad in Belgium. I think in English it's called The History Without a Name. Sorry, The Story Without a Name. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a story about a creepy pregnancy in which the devil is involved. Yeah. I might have to read it at some point, which just sounds so creepy and yeah. it's not really my cup of tea. Yeah, but somehow uh, I thought. And the camera really is creepy too. I don't know, but the camera never picks it up. But there's a really creepy ghost horse on it. Okay, the next book that I picked is uh, Le Saguin by François Mauriac. In English, it's called The Weakling, and this is a book which I read last year when I was so happy to spend uh, two months in Bordeaux. Uh, François Mauriac is also a writer who lived near Bordeaux. And this is the story about a young boy who's part of a degenerate noble family and he's somehow always out of place, um, a misfit in a certain way and yeah, maybe I could sympathize with that a little bit. Um, <laughs> You're a misfit. <laughs> I am quite the misfit. Uh, so this is a book that I really enjoyed. This is becoming rather revelatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good I don't have an entire booktube channel. You'd be like, look at me, yeah. it's so hard. <laughs> oh, <misery>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the next book that I picked is um, called Hier in French, which in English translates to as yesterday. It's a novel or a novella, maybe you would rather call it, by Agatha Christophe, who is a writer, or was a writer, I think she passed away a couple of years ago. She was born in Hungary, and then moved to Switzerland, but she always wrote in French. And I think um, the fact that she didn't write in her native language is very uh, important for her writing because she has this very simple, minimalistic writing style which, however, develops a yeah, very strong power of its own which is really captivating or which I found really captiva captivating when I read it. And I think uh, this novella, yeah, is about just two working class people who also live in, in exile and in their struggles and their daily yeah, their daily struggles, basically. Um, I found this one really intriguing. Does she qualify as French classic if she's... Is she Swiss? Or she's Swiss-Hungarian? Well, I thought French in the sense of francophone. Fair enough. Okay, so what about the German classics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although you have at least one real classic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that's the first one. In, uh, namely, E.T.A. Hoffmann, Der Sandmann, the Sandman in English. Um, it's a... Also a short story, actually. Um, I'm also reading bigger novels, but somehow all the, <laughs> all the books I picked for, for this selection are rather short ones. This sure, one... tell them you're reading long books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So this one I read in uh, in high school and I really enjoyed it. It's also also a gothic tale actually. Etia Hoffmann was a gothic writer in, in German Romanticism. And yeah, I don't know, for some reason I picked a lot of gothic tales. I really it's a pretty like. creepy one too. You kind of yeah. like creepy reads. <sighs> yeah, I do for some reason. Um, yeah. Alan, get me out of here! <laughs> <laughs> The next one I picked is by Robert Schneider. It's called Schlafes Bruder. Brother of Sleep, I think, is the English title. Uh, Robert Schneider is an Austrian writer and the novel was published in 1992 and actually pretty well received in, in Germany, but I think also on an international level. Sometimes considered to be an equivalent to Patrick Süskind's famous novel The Perfume because in The Perfume you have someone whose sense of smelling is really, it's really heightened and here it's hearing right? exactly so it's kind of an equivalent but it's also the story about someone growing up in, in a small Austrian village in the 19th century with a very strong church it really has a great impact on people's lives and his daily struggles as a yeah musical genius in a small Austrian village. I, I also found the language really dense and captivating and I remember that I only could read a couple of pages per day because it was just so intense that I felt like I needed to sink in first before I could continue reading. Thanks for the book! <laughs> I, think so. I think so. Although I didn't love it as much as you, but I also enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. No, for me it was really, really a revelation. The last book I picked as uh, my German favorites would be uh, Thomas, Thomas Klavinich, Das bin noch ich. Again, an Austrian writer. It hasn't been translated into English, but I guess roughly if you, you would translate it would be, but that's me. Yeah, and that's actually a satire on the German literary market. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that it was published in 2007, I think, yep. The title refers to Thomas Klavinich's friendship with Daniel Kehlmann, who is a very famous German-Austrian, again, <laughs> writer. Um, and the two of them had been friends quite a long time before Daniel Kielmann got famous, I think. But when he got so famous, uh, Thomas Klavinich was reading all the praise about him, uh, all the praise that qualified him as the leading German author of our time and all these things. And Thomas Lavinich thought, but that should be me, and hence the title, but that's me. Yeah. And yeah, it's a really funny read. I really enjoyed it. I read it last year when we went on holiday and it's one of my, you, you read it because of me, because it's one of my favorites. I've read it two yeah. times and recommended oh, right. it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really good fun, but sadly it hasn't been translated into English. But then again, I don't know if it would be that funny for a non-German audience, because there's a lot of specific references to famous German reviewers. And, yeah. But I think like there's also like universal things, like feeling like a failure, because yeah. he's like desperately trying to publish his novel and finding a publishing house for it. And in the meantime, his best friend's book is just selling hundreds and thousands of copies. Yeah. And, and he's also very neurotic as a, as a character, so that might also be something that would work for non I probably spoke to you, audience. didn't it? <laughs> I don't know what you are talking about. Let's throw a difficult question in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, a person, Time and Chance, who frequently comments on my videos, and thank you so much for that, by the way. And, um, uh, well, I guess they asked some uh, questions that are a little more challenging, but we'll, we'll ease you in, we'll ease you in with an easy one, which is basically just what are you specializing in within English Lit for your PhD, because mm -hmm. you're doing a PhD in English Literature. Yes, I am. And the dissertation is about the English essay, the essay is a literary form, and um, within this genre I would like to introduce a new subgenre, namely the Thing essay. So um, we have equivalent genres in, in, in other uh, literary forms like poetry or prose, narrative prose that is. We have the, the it narrative for example or the thing poem. There's also such a thing as thing theater, so literary texts which concentrate on one particular material item. And there are also a lot of essays which do the same thing. Um, thing. Um, <laughs> Starting with uh, Jonathan Swift's Meditation Upon a Broomstick, then going through Romanticism, for example, William Hazlitt's essay on a letter bell. In the 20th century, we have Rose Macaulay writing about armchairs or 
A couple of years ago, the contemporary uh, British essayist Geoff Dyer wrote an essay about a donut, um, but there's no, not really um, a category for this type of texts, and um, it's, yeah, it's kind of the gap which I hope I can start to close a little bit with my dissertation. Meanwhile, somebody is watching this video is like, I'm gonna steal this idea. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> No, I'm sure not. Everybody's very nice here. Okay, let's uh, get one question that's more difficult, I guess. Mm -hmm. How much was Shakespeare a propagandist who served the Tudor regime? Yeah. And honestly, I don't know. And I haven't looked this one up. So I'm curious what you have to say about it, because I know you did some research prior to this video. <laughs> Um, yeah, but not too much. I, yeah, I only so know what, what, why is he? A, why, why, was, why should he be considered a propagandist? Um, as far as I know, it's, uh, this uh, this reproach mainly uh, refers to his history plays. Oh, like, okay. For example, Richard the um, Third. Okay, I haven't read any of those. I have to admit. Yeah. So don't judge me. I will read them. <laughs> <laughs> The reproach is that he depicts like the Elizabethan age as a very flourishing age which um, ends all the misery that uh, the earlier monarchs inflicted on on England. But so it wasn't really all peaches and fun. <laughs> uh, no, of course it wasn't, but I mean at least... So that's were the not... point that he was like propagandist because of that. So yeah. do, you, do you agree or...? I don't know. But yeah, I mean there were civil wars before and everything, that's the War of the Roses that, that didn't occur. I don't know. I'll, I'd have to take a look again at the plays. And I have to say I'm actually a big fan of Shakespeare plays. Each time I read them, there are sentences where I'm just like struck and think, oh my god, that is just so well put, or the metaphor is just really strong. I think if that was the case, um, I think it would be a deficiency in Shakespeare plays, but I'd have to take a look at that again. Okay, so we'll leave that open-ended. <laughs> For a more lighter question, Megan Hannett asked, um, or actually she asked both of that, uh, us uh, what our favorite books from our childhood are, mm -hmm. but as I intend to make a separate video about that, I'm gonna make you wait for my answer, but you can tell us about your favorite uh, books from your childhood. Um, well, there were some picture books that I really liked. I actually wanted to look for one, but I didn't have the time for that. It was a nice picture book about a castle. With, I think it was a family of think dogs who... Uh, who lived in the castle? Yeah, and they built a hotel out of it. I really, really liked this Oh, that sounds book. cute. You never I, told me about that. I think I did. I no. Think, I think I even showed it to you at some point. When? couple of years ago. <laughs> okay, um, you have to show me again anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would be maybe from my early earlier childhood and then later on I think I have to go with the creepy stuff again. <laughs> um, I really liked R.L. Stein's uh, series Goosebumps. Although I guess if you read them as an adult they're not that creepy. Probably not, but I remember as a child I was really freaked out by some of them, but I still continued reading them. I read them too. I yeah. think a lot of us yeah. like it was a big thing in the 90s. Yeah, I just read that he sold 400 million copies of his books. So, and I think yes, somehow he actually he was actually the writer um, who made me start to read on a more permanent level. This writer because because I think you didn't start reading very much until yeah. you were what like 10 or yeah, I think 10, 10, 11. Yeah, 10 I think. 10. And um, yeah, and I think Goosebumps was really the. I did you, did you continue movies. with his like uh, Fear Street uh, no, series I, I because think... those were I think mm -hmm. were like targeted at older yeah. like more teenage stuff? No, I think I just read the Goosebumps series. I also read some of the Fear Street ones. Those were really creepy. Yeah, I but actually... then I get scared easily. So yeah, actually, what I did when I was eleven or twelve is that I just started reading adult books like adult crime novels um, <laughs> or thrillers. Just jumped like, straight in. <laughs> yeah, like John Grisham and everything. Um, oh, I read those too, but I don't yeah. know if I was 10. I was probably more like, I don't know, 14 or something. Well, I was 11 when I started reading them. I think oh, my I mother wasn't remember. too happy about it, but just, I just did it anyway. My mom out and out forbid me to read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde when yeah. I was 12. She said I was too young. So I, I think didn't get might... to read that until I was older, which is probably for the best, it but still at the same time, there's a bit of censorship going on there. That's true. No. <laughs> okay, do you want to have one uh, more challenging question again? Sure. Uh, by time and chance, how much should one separate the art from the artist? And I think we might disagree a little bit with that. Yeah. Um, and the example they give is the US expatriate and Mussolini propagandist Ezra Pound, who obviously is also very well known for his uh, modernist poetry? I don't, uh, yeah, it's a very tricky and uh, difficult question. I mean, I think I'm more generally for separating the two because I think the writing can be 
smarter than the person who wrote it. I think that's actually possible that texts develop a life of their own, which somehow can be detached from the writer. So I don't think we have to find the personality of the author behind the text. So I think it is possible that a text is really well written and there's this theory out there that if a text is well written it is automatically moral because otherwise it couldn't be true in a certain way. I don't know if I agree with yeah, that. Yeah. But... I think that might be But like what to... about like for example movie makers like Woody Allen? Mm -hmm. I mean the, I mean the movies are funny and everything, but then again you also have like constantly have films with older guys and younger mm -hmm. women, which is yeah. kind of creepy if you know his history. So it it, it, it it does reflect his creepiness, mm -hmm. but it's also I think it's, in a way, I mm, guess. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I think it's always easier once the people are dead because then you know that you're no longer supporting them financially and somehow... I think that's my rule of thumb. Yeah. Like, I won't... Like, with, like, whole recent accusations with Me Too movement, like, mm -hmm. certain artists I wouldn't want to support anymore financially. Like Roman Polanski or... Well, yeah, I mean, Roman Polanski's been known for a long time, but, like, yeah, other people, models, like... Yeah. Gosh, I can't think of his name. American Beauty, come on. Um, um, Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. Like, I really like the movies that I've seen with him, but mm. I wouldn't go out and watch new ones by him because I wouldn't want to support him financially. Yeah. But if the person is dead and can't benefit from it, I might be more lenient. It depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be my rule of thumb too, I think. <laughs> Are you just adopting my rule of thumb now? <laughs> no, no, I think it, it makes sense. But I think it's a bit problematic also to say that the writer was a bad person and hence the writing must be bad. No, I don't think that's yeah. the case. I don't think that's yeah. what people are trying to say. I think mm. it's just, do you... I mean, there's so much good writing. Do you need to go out and support the writing by that one person that was a horrible person? You know, if there's yeah, a lot of I'm, other good mm. writing to discover. Yeah, but what if this writing also is a benefit to, to literature? I'm excited. Are you excited? Yes. I'm a bit okay. nervous because I've never done this. It will be fine. And today I'm doing a Q&A with Daniel, my boyfriend. Hi guys. <laughs> Who's a bit nervous, so cut him some slack. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say that. <laughs> Sorry, we can edit it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know we should. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of you... Uh, Guys have been nice enough to leave questions on uh, my request. How do I put this? My formal request. My formal request for questions. <laughs> they left questions. That's nice. Let's just start over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is well, going awesome. Yeah. <laughs> do we edit this now? <laughs> I have no idea. Let's just go. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The second book that I picked is... <laughs> Do you get why this sometimes takes long? Yes. <laughs> Are we filming, by the way? I hope so. I so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are. We're all good. Okay, that's good. You can do it, I believe in yeah. you. That's a book I actually wrote back in high school. You wrote? 